So welcome to Quarterly Conversations, Q4 2021. Uh, it's been an interesting year, to say the least. I'm going to jump right into it. To say the least is correct. <laughs> so here's what we're going to cover today in uh, a, a few different slides. So if anyone uh, had a chance to, to read our market commentary, um, came out at the end of last week. If, if you didn't, you know, please, please go take a look. Uh, but the first thing we're going to cover is the five major trends uh, that we believe uh, are going to drive stock and bond markets uh, heading into 2022. Um, we're going to talk about the good and the bad, or maybe the good, bad, the ugly, depending on how you, uh, depending on how you view this. Um, there is, and we've talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel like we just are watching the federal reserve, but, um, we're going to talk about what we call the only chart that matters. Um, but I will, I will show you why we say, will history repeat itself? Uh, and then. A, a really big item for financial planning, um, tax changes. Uh, there have been several different drafts of what is now called the American Families Plan. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, what that might mean heading into uh, heading into 2022. It appears that it's going to be effective 2022. Um, so we'll take a look at that. All right. Gonna move our video here, but all right. Here's the big five trends: uh, monetary easing. In other words, the Federal Reserve buying bonds on the open market, putting a lot of cash into the economy, has created a huge surge in household wealth. Uh, that's going to be really important because now we have a ton of cash sitting on Americans' balance sheets. Uh, at the same time, the economy is pretty much reopened at this point. Uh, you know, of course, there's, uh, you know, depending on the state uh, you're in or if you're in an airplane or not in an airplane, whether you're on federal, uh, you know, uh, uh, federal property or not, there's mask mandates. But the economy is, is mostly opened, even though maybe it looks a little bit different, but the COVID drag uh, to the economy is, is seemingly going away or has gone away. Um, and those, the two of those things are combining the wealth surge as well as the, the, uh, uh, the COVID, the, the, the waning of the COVID drag are combining to create what appears to be sustained inflation. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, we obviously did talk about that a lot last quarter. Um, we'll, we'll get a little bit a little bit into it, but it looks like inflation is going to be a topic probably throughout 22, 2022 and beyond. Um, the bottom two pieces are kind of what's happening to somewhat combat these things because the risk you run with wealth surges and the economy reopening and inflation happening is, you know, is the economy going to overheat? So, uh, you know, one thing that's happening is, is the federal reserve has already announced they're starting to taper. In other words, they're putting less money into the marketplace than they were previously. And the question is, are they going to start to tighten? And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So is tapering going to turn into tightening? Uh, you know, both when and if. Uh, and then lastly, fiscal policy will, you know, will be much less accommodative. We've already seen uh, some of it with the proposed tax changes, but uh, it's probably a little more where that came from. So those are the big five. All right, the good and the bad. Let me move this video out of the way here. Good news and bad news. Start with the good news. Talked about the wealth surge. Uh, household debt. So Americans' balance sheets. We've, we've actually done a pretty good job of allocating the extra cash 
that has come out uh, as a result of the monetary easing. So debt service ratios are actually at a 40 year low. Now that is good news because most of the time when you get into a recessionary environment, it is marked by irresponsible debt use over leverage. Uh, you know, we've had a, an incredible uh, run up in the market uh, and it appears to not be because people are over leveraged. So that, that's good news. Uh, we talked a bit about the, you know, the, uh, the COVID drag <clears throat> starting to wane. Uh, the CDC is estimating that about 90% of Americans are either vaccinated, infected, or, or have been infected, or both. Um, uh, you know, uh, good, good news uh, for, uh, for the economy okay. reopening. Um, you know, and hopefully, you know, the one thing that hasn't quite seemed to rebound, I mean, there is uh, it's certainly more than it was back 18 months ago or even a year ago, but travel hasn't quite seemed to rebound as much as it, as much as uh, we might have expected. Um, you know, and obviously the one outstanding item, uh, which, you know, is yet to be seen is with the rise of remote work, what happens to commercial real estate, to office real estate, um, you know, is that going to permeate into the rest of the economy? You know, that, that could be a three to five year issue. We don't think it's going to be a major theme in 2022, but, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like even with, uh, uh, the economy kind of reopening, opening back up, um, not everybody's back in the office. Uh, so there seems like there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a shift there. Um, wage growth. So the labor, labor market is still tight, uh, even with, um, you know, even with the, the assistance, the aid, the, the unemployment, uh, uh, running out, the, the labor market is still very tight. Wage growth remains above 5%. Um, and the, the, the fact that we have sustained inflation something the Fed has actually been trying to create uh, for the better part of the last decade, uh, really kind of since, uh, since 2008. The fact that we actually have some sustained inflation, which we'll talk about a, a little bit more, is signaling that we have a healthy economy. So wages are growing, we have sustained inflation, there's a lot of cash on the sidelines, so there's a lot of room for growth. Now, the bad news to all of that is we're starting to see some issues in supply chain, so erratic price swings. Uh, uh, the Fed tapering, is that going to turn into tightening? Um, you know, so what the Fed is doing right now is they were, they were purchasing $120 billion a month of bonds on the open market. In other words, when the Fed purchases bonds, they're putting cash into the economy. They are reducing that by fifteen billion dollars a month. So, if, so if you do the math, it's about eight months that it's going to take for them to no longer be putting any extra cash, to no longer be doing any easing, um, you know, creating a, additional liquidity. Now, the the timing of that is important because this was announced in the September meeting minutes, and if you've been paying attention to the market for the last you know thirty to forty five days, the market did. Have a bit of a it's it since uh, came back, but it had a bit of a correction. It was down around five percent. Um, coincided almost perfectly with when the Fed said they were going to start tapering. Um, now again, tapering is not the same as tightening. Tightening is the exact opposite. So once the Fed stops the process of buying bonds in the open market, the question becomes: Are they going to start selling bonds in the open market? In other words, taking cash out. Uh, and that is right now, we do not know the answer to that. All we know is that somewhere around early summer next year, they will no longer be putting cash in. Uh, and it is likely that, you know, somewhere around their, their June or July meeting minutes, uh, you know, we're going to be paying close attention to, are they going to start increasing rates? Are they going to start selling bonds on the open market? And, and what is that going to mean? Um, 
Now, right now, the, 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 the good news is with the Fed starting to taper, it should help to combat the supply chain issues. Uh, they tend to come in very aggressively and kind of just go away. Um, you know, the question is going to be, are, are they transitory or is it signaling the fact that the Fed kind of overcorrected? In other words, put too much money in. Yeah, I think there's a couple pieces to this puzzle, Ben. Um, one of the things is that um, you talk about household debt uh, ratios. Um, um, household, technically, in the household debt ratios, being the lowest we've had in 40 years, um, gives us a little boost in, in the household market, where, in the housing market specifically, where they can continue to buy housing and support this housing market that we have right now. Uh, we talked a little bit about in the uh, about the housing market in our in our last quarterly conversations, um, and this is where uh, we create a lot of um, support in this housing market. So um, we don't expect a big drop uh, in if, if things shift gears a little bit with inflation and the Fed does start tightening down. Um, I think what we'll see is more of an expansion of the availability of housing. Um, the other thing that we haven't seen yet. Um, is is uh, new housing starts kicking up uh, aggressively. And that's the other piece that we were looking at. But this wage growth that we're talking about, 5%, which is very important to the Federal Reserve starting to, um, to, starting to taper and starting to increase interest rates uh, if wage growth continues. Uh, there was an article I was just reading and somebody I was just, um, one of our partners I was just talking to the other day, talked a little bit about those who are not participating in the market, right, or in the, um, or in the employment uh, world at this point in time. Um, there's a good handful, and I think they were talking about three to four percent of um, those who were employed that actually stepped out um, either through early retirement or retirement that could come back into the market a little bit later, which um, could help uh, contain that, that growth in wages. They don't know if and when they're going to come back, but it's possible that they could come back into the market, uh, into the labor market at a later date, um, and it you know and contain this growth of of uh, wage. The um, supply chain issues. You, know, you touched on some of the supply chain and, and when that may come back uh, and start being able to support the economy and 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 trans transfer um, uh, goods throughout the country. Um, there was there was a supply chain issue before this started, and it's it's basically the supply chain issue was um, they're coming out with much larger boats where our ports can't support those much larger boats. And there's only a, a few ports that that can down in Florida and out in California that can support those larger boats. So a lot of the the. Um, the, the, the money going into infrastructure is going to go into infrastructure in the in the ports also. Um, enhancing the ports and enhancing the robotic benefits of the ports to be able to pull um, things off, pull uh, containers off of the ships onto the onto the trucks to be transferred, where you don't need as much labor force to do that. So there's a lot of good pieces in this that can contain inflation. Um, and and you know if if inflation once it does back down in, in this, and uh, as far as um, um, the tr the um, the the, um, the spikes that we're having in different areas. Once that once that does uh, start backing down, we may not have that runaway inflation that we we're talking about. Um, that could happen. Um, the Fed also has a bunch of levers that they can use. You did talk about the tapering aspects, and the other piece which you also mentioned is that they that they started to use um, a bit back in 2015 16, and that's they have a huge balance sheet where they can start selling. Um, bonds back into the market and uh, and pulling that cash off the market. So they don't have to use the the increased interest rates that they used back in the 70s and 80s on an aggressive basis because they have those other levers, levers that they can use. Yeah, and I want to talk about that a little bit just before we get off the, uh, I just wanted to point out one thing with the inflation um, and and that's a it's a good point because the reason supply chain issues tend to be transitory is because the supply chain will catch up. You know, ports will be improved, processes will be improved because, you know, if the demand is there, 
and it's a sustained demand, well, you know, we're going to make the changes that we need, you know, to meet, to meet that demand. <clears throat> um, uh, but, th but the reason this is important is because headline inflation, uh, the CPI has been running really hot. Uh, it, it was just about five and a half percent. I think it was June, July. I have it in the letter here, June, July, and August, five and a half percent. Um, now here's the thing. Most of it was coming from supply chain issues, but there, there is a metric called trimmed mean personal expenditures. And if you use that as your inflation metric, the interesting thing is this inflation is not at a runaway pace, but it is now at a sustained pace. And what I mean by that is if you were to take out what this trimmed mean consumptions expenditures uh, metric does is it takes out whatever good had the biggest price swing. So if you remember, uh, you know, back in June, July, August, the, the same, uh, you know, the same uh, months that I'm referencing here, used <laughs> auto sales were up like 15%. Um, mostly supply chain issues because car dealers couldn't couldn't get new cars in they were behind they were not meeting demand so used auto sales jumped that that's part of cpi is that 15 percent jump in used auto sales now it's due to a supply chain issue once they figure out the supply chain issue that, that won't happen again but anyway point is this this trimmed mean personal consumption consumptions expenditures metric has been sustained at or above right around two to two and a half percent that's important because it's been close to zero for the last 10 years. And what this is telling us is that, that if you take out the wild erratic price swings, underneath all of it is a ground swell of actual real inflation that's here to stay. The supply chain issues will be ironed out, but goods are gonna start getting more expensive because there's more cash out there. And that real inflation is actually good for our economy. That's not bad for our economy. It's good for growth. It will take a little bit of the market growth out of the picture, but um, in essence, it'll it's it's actually good for our economy. Uh, yeah, that is that is that is correct. Good news, inflation. Bad news, supply chain issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that's where we are right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward here. Oh, all right. So we talked about the. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of explain what we're looking at here. We talked a little bit about tapering versus tightening. This is really where the the rubber starts to meet the road for for portfolios. Um, this may be the only chart that matters anymore because the Federal Reserve, while they're supposed to be the lender of last resort, has kind of changed their role to just being the ultimate market maker. Um, correlation doesn't always mean causation, but the amount of time that is, that is represented in this chart. So this is since 2008, which is essentially, uh, kind of the new era, uh, if you will, of, um, monetary theory, they call, you know, modern monetary theory and actually putting it into practice. The, the red is the S&P 500, so broad measure of U.S. stocks. The blue is the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So when we say the Federal Reserve is easing, we mean they're adding to their balance sheet. So the blue line is going up. They did this after 2008, after the recession. They did this right after COVID hit. Um, and you can actually see all of these stages in the shaded blue. So after 2008, you can see the shaded blue after COVID. The reason we bring it up this time is because what we're heading towards is the shaded pink area, which you can see is referred to as QT. And QT means quantitative tightening. And Obviously, there's ups and downs, there's some volatility, but you can you can kind of tell that, right, that, you know, stocks are tending to follow the trend 
of where the Fed's balance sheet is. I mean, and probably none more direct uh, in terms of the correlation here versus COVID, you know, than the, than the actual COVID um, uh, bounce back here. So, you know, we had a, a was it about, I think it was like 32% correction, Rick, something like that. Uh, 32% that was, around that, that correction around 32, on the S&P. Yep. Yep. And it just came rocketing back. And the timing was, I mean, uh, it's really hard for you to say like, you know, hey, this had to do with actual economic uh, uh, growth that we had. No, it's it's the Fed was just pushing a bunch of cheap capital into the into the marketplace, and the the stock you know stock market just followed. Um, but if you look at the QT section, the QT is when the Fed starts to tighten. So we're not there yet. We don't know when we're going to be there. All we know is that at the earliest, it would be next summer. The point with QT is this, what you can kind of see is that as the Fed started to pull the amount of cash in the marketplace down, the market sort of wavered. It was up, up, down, up, down, mostly flat. And then there was sort of an inflection point right here. I'm going to try to capture this right here to here. There was a little bit of an inflection point and it was, you really couldn't predict exactly when it was going to happen, but you knew it was going to happen at some point just because they were reversing all the cheap capital they put in. Um, and that was September. It was Q4, uh, 2018. Yeah. Uh, you so call, you call that inflection point. I call that opportunity point. Yeah, right. Because when we started doing that, we saw that coming and there was no fundamental um, undertone to, to support that. So that market started dropping and fundamentally there was no reason. It was just the Fed starting to pull money off the balance sheet. Right. And uh, right. which created opportunity for us to be able to shift portfolios around a little bit. Yeah, and it was close close to a twenty percent pullback, and you can see, you, you know, the, the silver lining to this is if they if they do it responsibly, which, um, you know, this was a huge amount of capital they put in, so it'll be interesting to see how how they handle this. But you can see that the market did come roaring back, and and even if you just stayed fully invested throughout that time, from the beginning of tightening to the end of tightening, you know, the, the market it, it did still grow. You just had a lot more volatility and as rick says you know there's opportunity there if there's cash on the sidelines if there's you know uh we'll talk a little bit about bonds but you know short-term bonds things that are somewhat liquid it, there's there's buying opportunity and that's what we're going to be paying attention to with with the quantitative tightening not necessarily trying to time it because it's going to get pretty choppy but when it, you know when and if we do start to see a correction we we want to be opportunistic because it it tends to be sharp and and quick uh, as you can see it 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 does bounce back um, but yet to be seen when that will happen could be next year um, but really really depends on on how the economy is reacting to the tapering um, yeah we're expecting a lot more volatility to get into the market um, we're not expecting. A lot. We're not expecting a crash to happen. We're right. not expecting a major um, market downside to happen. Um, but it's it's all about the volatility, and yeah. that creates opportunity. Yeah. So we'll be watching this pretty closely. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about what it. Oh, let me move our video here. What it means for portfolios. Um, so this is, I mean, this is really what it boils down to, right? So what, what are we doing, uh, about some of these trends? Uh, what are we looking for? What could it mean? And the first thing is, is this is it's a headwind for growth stocks and, and specifically tech stocks, anything that has just benefited from extra cash where price has just appreciated, you know, and we've heck, we've been talking about this probably even for the last three years, but, you know, the, w w the market being overvalued, PE ratios being high, um, you know, cheap capital coming out uh, is going to be a headwind for, for growth stocks. 
Um, this is pretty much where the headwind for the broad market comes in because, you know, most, most indexes are now market cap weighted. Uh, so, you know, your Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google's of the world. Um, now that they are taking up a larger percentage of the overall market, if there's a headwind to those in the form of tightening, you know, monetary tightening, it's it's going to spell a headwind for the, the the market at large, which is what you saw in the previous chart. That's that's the reason that um, you know that we, that you want to pay attention to the tightening. Um, we talked a lot about this last quarter, actually probably the last two quarters. Um, value could finally see its day in the in the limelight. So more conservative. Uh, stocks, dividend payers in particular, tend to do well in inflationary environments. This does not mean, I don't want to confuse this, this does not mean that those stocks would not have a similar headwind from a price perspective if the market is volatile. However, what it means is that they are very well positioned to take advantage of consumer price inflation, um, much more so than, than growth stocks and tech stocks. So, you know, consumer defensive, you think of household products, you know, cyclical stocks, utilities, uh, all tend to benefit from inflationary environments, um, all uh, tend to do very well. The last piece, which we talked about a little bit, you know, where you can get opportunistic, uh, and this has been a theme for, for a while now, but staying short on the yield curve. Um, interest rates are expected to increase um, mid to late 2022. Again, th that's an expectation. Uh, we, we don't know by when and by how much exactly, and that could change. But we are still, you know, in, in a much larger part than, than, uh, than we would typically looking toward short-term bond funds and treasury ladders. Um, you know, on the fixed income side of the portfolio. And, and that gives us the ability to have some, you know, have some dry powder if we do get a little bit of a pullback uh, uh, in the marketplace. So, and all that's about making the portfolio a little bit more aggressive um, during, during the risk on opportunities when the market drops down and then making it a little bit more conservative um, on, the, on the risk off timeframes. Um, and Dan, I think that, you know, where these value stocks, the last time I think we've seen value stocks and, and, and growth stocks take a role like this at this level was actually back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when we crossed over the Y2K bubble. And, um, you know, everybody was caught up into the tech stocks. There was a lot of growth in, in, um, in, in quite a few different tech, tech stocks like Microsoft back in that day. Um, and what, what we saw was the, the actual tech stocks slow down a bit. And um, during, the, during, the, um, um, during the March of 2000, when Y2K didn't actually happen and some of these tech stocks fell apart, not all of them, they still had a lot of, lot of momentum behind a lot of them, but uh, we saw value pick up quite a bit because value was being pushed aside for so long as it has been over the last quite a few years. Um, so this is where the opportunity of value comes into play and does well in an inflationary environment, because right after we got through the, the Y2K, um, the World Trade Center issue, right towards the end of 2002, we started having a decent run up from 2002 all the way to 2007, I believe, in, right. the, um, in the value yeah, until, stocks. Until the recession, right. Until the recession, they just kept clicking up interest rates and they were trying to control things a little bit on the on the inflationary side. So that's uh, that's that's where that's where these play a big role in, a, in an inflationary environment. Well, and, and I agree. I mean, it's a good comparison, which is why I say we still have, have room to run. It's not without volatility. And, and again, the, you know. I do think the fact that we don't have a high level of debt is a is a big indicator of that there's you know not as uh, large of a risk of recession. We're not over leveraged, um, which is which is a good thing. Uh, so I'm going to go to the next tier. Okay, so the 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 last big trend we were talking about was fiscal policy being less accommodative. Uh, uh, heading into 2022, we we do 
So we do finally have some some clarity here. Uh, it, it, I, I Rick knows this, and and probably most people on the call know this. I I hate talking about tax planning, theoretical tax planning in advance, because until we really know, what, and, and actually you'll, you'll, you'll see why, because there's a lot of, there's a couple items that are notably missing from this, which we thought might be in it, but, uh, but are not, or actually I should say we're in previous drafts and have now been omitted. Um, uh, but I hate doing tax planning in, in advance just because uh, you, you know, you're essentially then planning for something that that may never happen. Um, and and I think the only once in history was a tax change ever done retroactively, meaning usually when there's a tax change, you have some time to do planning between, you know, the time that that it uh, is signed into law and the time it becomes enacted. So, you know, a, a bit of a caveat here, this American Families Plan, this is I believe it's the third draft, third draft of, of new tax legislation. It appears, I'm cautiously going to say it appears that this will be in place. I don't know if it's going to be effective as of 2022, but it's, it, it appears that most of these initiatives have a good level of bipartisan support. Uh, so or at least enough to get signed into law. So um, we are going we are going to cautiously talk about this and and start thinking about you know what the tax planning issues uh, surrounding this new legislation are 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 going to be. Um, so a couple of things. What what really what this bill does is it extends uh, you know a couple of the provisions of the American Rescue Plan, the COVID bailout plan, notably the. Um, Child tax credits, dependent care credits will permanently become a part of tax law based on this plan. So these were put in place uh, specifically as part of the fiscal stimulus, not to be confused with the monetary stimulus that the uh, Federal Reserve um, uh, put into place, the fiscal stimulus that was put into place during COVID. The other thing that it does, there's a couple of uh, other provisions, but the other thing that it does is it repeals uh, some of the uh, the Trump tax cuts, the uh, the Tax Cuts and Job that Jobs Act. So uh, one of the things that, that uh, the Trump tax cuts did was it changed the tax brackets. The top bracket went from 39.6% to 37. This would bring the top bracket back to 39.6%. But then it puts in a slew of other changes, um, and and I, I have the the kind of the three notable ones up here. But essentially, what this seems to do is, if you're making over four hundred fifty thousand dollars, if you're a joint filer, or over four hundred thousand dollars of taxable income, you are deemed as high income, and and there are a ton of different tax laws that now will apply. If you are above those levels, so that the top bracket increases, um, capital gains above that level are now at 25% uh, plus the net income tax, the, the net investment income tax, the Medicare surtax. So, the, you know, if you add that, the, t the top capital gains rate is is uh, is actually more like 28.9%, um, and no Roth conversions if you're above that income level. Now, interestingly, they're giving you 10 years, though. So we, we think that's probably a uh, kind of a, a fire sale. They're trying to generate tax revenue by, uh, you know, if you're, you're a high income earner, uh, you, can, you can still do Roth conversions for, for up to 10 years. One thing that has been added, and we will see if it remains in the legislation, is that this would eliminate backdoor Roth. So what that means is you can no longer convert after tax IRA dollars into Roth effective immediately. There is no 10 year rule on that. You can't do it. So it would, it would close, it would close the backdoor Roth quote unquote loophole. Um, even though the IRS has said that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an allowed transaction. Uh, this would effectively kill it. Um, 
Lastly, and I, I'm, 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 I want to talk about this here because there are other estate planning issues that were notably missing. The one estate planning concern that has been introduced as part of this bill is that grantor trusts would be eliminated, which if you don't know what a grantor trust is, essentially what it does is it allows you to push, uh, push assets out of your estate without, uh, with, without giving up control, in essence. I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Rick, but uh, no, you got it. Big changes if they all go through. Now, like I said, this was the this was the third draft. So the first and second draft of the legislation had a couple of big items that are act, that are missing um, from the American Families Plan. Now, it's it's certainly possible that another bill could be introduced, but um, a, a, a few of these were in the initial drafts and and are and are no longer in. Uh, you know, what is currently in front of lawmakers. Um, one is the federal estate exemption. <clears throat> We've been talking about this. It, it almost feels like every year. Um, they were talking about bringing it back to the three and a half million dollar estate exemption, which it was back 2009 and, and prior in 2009, it was increased. Um, looks like that's going to remain. Uh, you know, so uh, I don't know what it is now, 11 point, around $11 million, 11, eight. 11, yeah, 11, 8, 11, 8, 8. Yep. um, yep. you know, per spouse, uh, you know, can be transferred free of federal estate tax. Looks like that's going to stay in place. Uh, I, I know they have their crosshairs on it, but it appears that, that, uh, that is not going to be changing. Uh, another piece, and this was part of the, uh, uh, the Trump tax cuts. The salt limitation, state and local tax, uh, it looked like there was going to be enough that they would allow, you know, property taxes, at least property taxes to be fully deductible right now, state and local plus property taxes are state and local income, you know, plus, plus property taxes are limited to $10,000 of deduction a year. It looked like they were going to have enough support to, to at least, uh, you know, do away with the cap on property taxes. That was not included in the, in the most recent draft. So it, it appears that that's going to stay in place. Uh, uh, 1031s. Uh, so like kind exchanges for real estate, sidestepping capital gains uh, was initially included as not, you know, as something that they were going to do away with. It, it appears they will not. And lastly, I've, I've had a lot of conversations about this one because again, it, it was in the, in the initial draft and, and uh, you know, Biden's been talking about it, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not in this, in this draft. Uh, cost basis step up at death for inherited, inherited assets a appears that that's going to remain. So you will still get a your your heirs would still get a step up in cost basis for any appreciated stock property, um, you know that 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 they inherit. So that it looks like that's going to stay in place at least for now. I, I do think these four are are probably still going to be discussed. Um, you know, and I'm curious to see if there's another version of this bill introduced or 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 maybe even another bill. Um, in, entirely, uh, but at least for now, based on what we what we're seeing proposed, these these are all going to stay in place. Um, so not much of a change, unless you're over those high income thresholds, or if you're doing backdoor Roths. Those are the two major things to look at. Is is essentially they're they're trying to get rid of tax free growth. So that's going to be the major planning opportunity. Is how do you get as much as possible into tax free growth? Because eventually. It's going to be more difficult to do. Yeah, I'd go back to that last slide, Dan. Yep. I think I think this is a big aspect for the middle to upper middle class area because as long as we can leave the the exemption where it is, um, grantor trust is not a big deal for somebody in that environment. Um, where grantor trust come into play in an aggressive pace is anything beyond twenty million to twenty to twenty five million dollars. Um, yep. Although grantor trusts are used down in the in the middle of the upper middle class area, but it's it's that's that's it's a, a lot. Of, it's a bigger tool for the for for the wealthier. Um, it was I agree in, until they address the estate exemption. 
Right. Once they address the estate is a state exemption. If they bring that down, then we're in then we're in trouble because right. grantor trusts were in big use prior to that uh, step up in the exemption. Right. Um, we used them quite a bit back in uh, the early two thousands. Um, but then you know the ten thirty one real estate exchanges. They're huge when you have um, when you have rental property, a, a, uh, whether it be in the in the mountains or the beach or whatever. Um, there's commercial there, property, yeah. Commercial property, yeah. Transition in commercial property, rental property. Um, that that is a is not only used for the ultra wealthy. It's also used for quite a bit in the in the middle class environment, the middle to upper middle class environment. And um, and I know everybody is wor worried about those cost based step ups because not everything um, you can't you can't go back and find the cost basis on a good handful of assets, especially property when it comes to selling those. Yeah, but I, I just wanted to touch on that more specifically because of the grantor trust rules and how they don't necessarily affect us in that in, in, in this environment if they if we can maintain these um, these uh, especially the federal exemption in place. Right. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So, uh, so that is all we have today. Uh, hopefully, it was helpful. I'm gonna, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm gonna, we'll we'll stick on for a second here. Just you know, type it into the uh, chat box, Q and A box, uh, whichever is easier. I'm just gonna stick here for a second. All right. Seeing nothing. I, we, we must have explained it very clearly. We've answered all the questions from last <laughs> time and this time. And a lot of the questions that I've been hearing from clients over the last couple of months. So, which was covered very well in the letter, Dan, by the way. So I do, uh, I'm just gonna, oh, I do have one here. Um, uh, oh, that, that was uh, just a comment. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, th there was, if anybody did read the letter, there was, and I'll, I'm just going to touch on it just because I think it's interesting and I'll, and I'll call it out <clears throat> in the last section of the letter. I just did a little bit of a write up on, on, um, we've been talking about it forever. And it, it's, it's, I, I found a statistic that piqued my interest to the point where I felt it warranted enough consideration that we would put it in here. Uh, so if you haven't, haven't read the letter, uh, just, just pull it up. And this is the last section. Uh, talking about cryptocurrency and uh, and blockchain. Uh, so this was very interesting to me, and I don't know, uh, you, you know, I, I am certainly not a an expert on any of this stuff. Um, but Bitcoin is obviously the well known cryptocurrency, uh, and the entire you know, power of cryptocurrency is the blockchain technology. Uh, blockchain technology is now built on something called Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum is essentially, it's like Visa, right? So, you know, your cards with your bank, you and you're, you're spending in dollars. Uh, Visa is the one verifying the, the transactions. So Ethereum is kind of the, the chassis that a lot of these currency, cryptocurrencies are built on. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is this. Apparently in, in Q2, this year in the second quarter, Ethereum verified the same amount of transactions as Visa did, $2.5 trillion worth of transactions. What, what, what that means is now this is, of course, there's, there's, there's trading activity, um, but there's also a lot of, uh, you know, you can now exchange Bitcoin on PayPal or Venmo, just like you would, you know, uh, dollars, you know, transferring dollars from one person to another. Um, essentially, what this means is there's, there's as much money changing hands using cryptocurrency as there is using Visa cards. And that was kind of eye-opening to me, uh, you know, and in my head that kind of put it as this, you know, this is not really a, a, a fad anymore. Um, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to point that out because I thought it was really interesting. So when you're talking about changing hands, Dan, um, 
explain that a little bit. It's it's not like people are going out and using cryptocurrency to buy their everyday groceries and things like that. Uh, no, no, they they aren't. It's it's not being used for that kind of stuff. But it, it, you know, you you if, if you're paying somebody cash for services, you you can you can pay them in in Bitcoin. You can pay them on PayPal using Bitcoin. You can pay them on Venmo using Bitcoin. Um, you can, you know, purchase, uh, Bitcoin on Coinbase or any of the other apps. So it, you know, I don't have a breakdown of, of what it's being used for, which is actually kind of the whole point of cryptocurrency, right? Is it's, is it's, uh, you know, kind of a decentralized ledger. It's just, it's just transaction data. Um, but you know, the, the, the point is it's becoming more, it's becoming, becoming popular to a point you know, that it, it, it may be mainstream, you know, within the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, actually, and I the heard... important thing to, to realize is this, it's not Bitcoin itself. It's the process and the technology behind how transactions get verified. And I, I, I just drew a comparison in the letter in the commentary we think about electronic transfers, online banking. Um, you know, these are this is kind of how we use technology to manage our finances, right? We can go online. We have online banking. You can transfer money from one account to another, from one person to another. You can do bill pay. You can transfer investment accounts. You can, you know, do all of these things online. It used to be that you had to have a stock certificate, or you had to get it, you know. Um, uh, it, it was not standardized. And nowadays it's standardized. And the interesting thing about that is that those two systems, it essentially boils down to two major systems, the ACH system and the ACAT system. Those, those systems were first used in 1972 and 1985. 1972 and 1985. That is right. That's right around when the internet was invented. So in other words, a lot of our lives have been transformed by the internet, but our, the way we manage our money and our finances, it hasn't really kept up with the, with the progress of the internet and other facets, entertainment, news, information, that has completely changed since the inception of the internet. For our money management, all that's changed is it's a lot easier to access, but the systems we are using, I mean, have you ever wondered why you can't transfer money on a weekend? I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? The bank, banks why would the bank need to be, banks are closed, yeah. but you're doing it online. You're doing it electronically. Why, why does the bank, why would it matter if the bank is closed? And the reason is because, you know, the system that we were using was put in place 50 years ago, and it actually still requires physical input. It actually requires a person to be verifying the transaction. Um, so, so the point is, is the entire sort of cryptocurrency movement, personally, I don't believe represents, uh, I mean, it, it certainly could represent, but I don't, I don't think that, that it's, uh, ultimate use is going to be to, to dethrone the dollar or to decentralize currency. I think that it, you know, the technology behind it is going to revolutionize the way that we move money around. Yeah, not necessarily cryptocurrency, just money right. in general. So right. um, because cryptocurrency right now, we were just reminded, and we're not saying to make an investment in cryptocurrency at all. Um, but they, you know, cryptocurrency is used right now aggressively um, to drive illegal transactions, as one of our comments came up here right. um, from somebody on the call. Um, is 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 you know, it's, it's used to 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 cover ransomware, and I'm driving up the, the the transactions on those too. So, which is which is very interesting because we've heard a lot about that and. Um, actually, um, somebody that's fairly close to us, their company had to re had to had gotten locked down, um, and not in our industry, but in a tech industry, where they had gotten locked down and had to pay a million dollars in ransomware. 
right uh, right. through cryptocurrency which and is- and and that is the that is the achilles heel right so the technology is great but the decentralized currency will will create an issue yeah so somewhere there's a happy marriage where you have the good the 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 the, the new technology without the, the you know essentially the lack of transparency because for illegal transactions like that it can't be tracked Right. So how about how about the how about the the one um, Bitcoin that that Dan, that Tom Brady paid for his uh, to get his football back to the actually he didn't pay to get it back. The guy the guy that that uh, that gave it back to him after 600 touchdown pass, he gave him <laughs> one crypto, one one uh, one Bitcoin for 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 giving him his football back. Um, well, we got another. What's so it? I heard. So I heard. That, that he took that he got the raw end of that deal because so the auction houses are estimating that that football is worth around half a million dollars and what did he pay for it like uh sixty three thousand dollars yeah that whatever bitcoin? whatever a bitcoin is like 60 <laughs> grand or something i think they gave him a thousand dollar gift card to like the team store too but <laughs> <laughs> it was a generous return yeah right right um we do have a question that came up here. Federal Reserve is developing an instant real-time payment service called FedNow. Um, not sure of the target availability date, but um, you're familiar? So I, I, I'm not familiar with it. I've heard of it, but I, uh, I don't know if it's using blockchain technology or not, but you know, that, that's, that that's kind of the point to the to this commenter's uh to the point to this commenter's point is real time payment service. The U.S. does not have any real time payment service, and and you know personally, I believe that the value of crypto is is not in the decentralized currency. It's not in the fact that you can mask these transactions, and it's not in um you know the the a, a lack of confidence in the U.S. dollar or anything like that. It's in it, it's in this sort of the real time payment service. The fact that you can you know money can change hands very quickly. Yeah, and I've have heard a little bit about Fed now, and I think yeah. that's the basis that it's built on. Yeah, I, I'm assuming so. I I don't know for sure though. Um, but that's that's a good comment. I'll have I'll have to look more into that. Um, I'm assuming it's built on blockchain technology, but. Uh, at any rate, well, good. Um, All right, just a good piece of news um, that I heard today uh, that um, people are going out shopping a little bit more now and spending more time out um, buying things at the store rather than uh, buying them off of Amazon. Um, so you might see a little bit of pullback, not necessarily pullback, aggressive pullback in Amazon because I don't think people are gonna stop using it, but um, it's good to know that um, your comments about about COVID and people were getting more comfortable being out there and starting to um, uh, support their local stores. Yeah, that is good. That is that is good news. Where did you see that? Uh, that came up on the, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal today. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this has been a good hour. Uh, like I said, if you ever, you know, can't join these, uh, watch it on YouTube. We have kind of a, an abridged version. I think we usually get it to, to 30 minutes. We, we chop out some of the, some of the fluff, but, um, uh, thank you everyone. And, uh, we will talk to you soon. Have a good day.